Thank you, everyone, for joining us here this evening. What an interesting time it is to be alive. In so many fields, things are moving faster than they ever have before. And one of those fields, as it happens, is artificial intelligence. AI has been promised for a long time, but now in the year 2017, we're finally starting to see some interesting developments. Through AI technology and search engines, access to information like we've never had before. In medicine, artificial intelligence being used to both create new knowledge through automated drug discovery and make better use of the knowledge we already have through AI-assisted diagnosis. And in hopefully the near future, self-driving cars with all the benefits of traffic safety and leisure time that they'll bring. At the same time as a student of artificial intelligence, one comes to realize that things aren't quite what they seem. Reading the news these days, it's easy to get the wrong impression about AI, about what it really is and about how fast things are really moving. As a student of artificial intelligence, one starts to worry that a lot of people, a lot of organizations are starting to get the wrong impression about AI. If we make careful choices about AI over the next few decades, choices involving everyone in society, AI seems to have the potential to really make our lives better. But if our choices are based only on surface impressions rather than deeper understanding, one starts to worry that we may never get to see the full potential of AI. So, what can we do about this? Well, you join us here tonight for the opening of a series organized by REACH, Research and Technology in Switzerland. REACH is the grassroots think tank for science, technology, and society, founded by a team of young researchers with a remit of establishing a science-friendly culture. In the context of artificial intelligence, this remit is based on three beliefs. First, we believe that a basic trust in science is crucial for the well-being of society. Science has helped us repeatedly to overcome challenges and solve fundamental problems in society, and artificial intelligence is going to be a big part of that over the next few decades. But that trust involves recognizing that discussion in society is not only a matter of facts, but also of values. That the choices we make in the near future, that in those choices we make in the near future, both scientific fact about artificial intelligence and societal values about what kind of future we want, that both sides must be respected in the debate. Second, we believe that science has a responsibility to foster an informed public debate. Part of that is making it clear what the risks and benefits of artificial intelligence could be, and we'll be covering that in the later events in our series. The focus tonight, though, is on making it clear what AI really is, something we hope we've been able to give you a first taste of through our exhibition currently taking place downstairs in the ETH main hall. But the third belief is that Science not only has a responsibility to foster an informed public debate, but also to make it clear what the choices are. To make it clear that AI is not just something happening to us. That we can influence which direction things move in. That we do have a choice about the future relationship between man and the machine. So, what are the answers to these questions? This informed public debate what does artificial intelligence really mean right now? The choices that lie ahead of us, what do we have to expect? Luckily, we have an expert on hand to answer both of these questions. Pascal Kaufmann began his journey with a master's in neuroscience from ETH. During his studies, he spent time in the United States, but returned to ETH for his PhD at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, where he researched humanoid robots and brain-computer interfaces. Following his PhD, he entered the world of business and currently serves as CEO and co-founder of Starmind, a young company that uses artificial intelligence to collect and curate company knowledge. In his own words, obsessed by robots, cyborgs, and artificial intelligence, he joins us here tonight for his talk, The State of Art Artificial Intelligence on the Future of Man and Machine. Pascal, all yours. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, 
Why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Well, um, it is a great honor for me to speak here at the Auditorium Oxmo of ETA Zurich, uh, my alma mater. Um, I'm deeply humbled to return to here, where I spent so many years struggling and uh, with sleepless night, of course. I owe a lot to ETA Zurich. I owe a lot to my parents. I owe a lot to my professor. And I think you can even feel the spirit when you walk through the halls here at ETH, you, you feel the globally leading institution where so many fam famous scientists before us, like thought leaders, pioneers, walked the halls. I must admit that something that kept me going was actually the moon landing itself, like the moon landing, the spirit of Apollo, and that's also the reason why I actually opened my lecture with this picture here. And when you look at this, the question is, what was the Apollo program really about? And I think the Apollo program conveyed the confidence and energy and a vision that did capture the imagination of the world. It inspired an optimism about technology and enthusiasm for the future. If we could fly to the moon, as so many have asked and even doubted, what else were we capable of? So if the history of science teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. I believe that one day in the not too distant future, we will be able to create true AI. We will be able to understand organisms. We will be able to understand interaction between brain and body, and we can create artificial intelligence. It is important to me, I think also to us, to take on a leading role in these developments in order to shape them and understand them. So what do we need for the creation of artificial intelligence? What is blocking us these days? I believe in the power of ideas. I believe in outstanding talents. I believe that it's important to create a momentum, a movement, a devotion to that one of the greatest endeavors that we have of humankind to decode the human mind itself. So, however, when you screen the newspapers of today, it's a little bit frustrating, considering the information channels that we have, considering the biased information networks we are in, it is very hard to judge and to qualify what is actually science, what is science fiction, and what is complete hype. So I hence like to walk you through a few of my personal views about AI, about the state and progress of robotics, and also about the hype that is created around those topics. And uh, yeah, let me share with you one of my very first humble approaches in AI. It's actually my first attempt to tackle the brain by connecting living brains with machines. So I'm a neuroscientist by training. My task was to dissect those brains out of animals, put them in dishes with artificial blood, and keep those brains alive for a few more days. It looked actually like Frankenstein's office. So I had to insert electrodes into these uh, living brains, into the visual nerves here, and connect them directly to a mobile robot which moved around with the video camera signals. And those video camera signals then were fed back to the uh, visual nerves in this brain sitting in this dish, kept alive. And um, if you were that brain, or I was that brain, and all of a sudden, instead of your biological eyes or your glasses, you have directly electrodes pinched to your visual nerves, you, of course, would like to do something with your body. But the problem was, the body was just like cut away. So the only thing that looked out of the brain was a little bit of spinal cord. So I inserted again uh, two electrodes into the output of the brain and fed it back to the wheels of this robot. And this was in the year 2001, one of the very first cyborgs, like the connection between a brain and a machine. So why do I tell you that story before Opero, actually? It is here where the technology of StarMind emerged and where a lot of ideas actually uh, were born. And what I also learned is, 
I gave one interview in the States at the Chicago Medical School, and I started my interview, actually, the cyborg is not a robot cop, but and then I extended uh, many minutes about how great the research is and about a lot of details, but actually the newspaper just captured cyborg. So you have to be extremely careful when you talk about these kind of things, because the media uh, get crazy about that. And therefore, it's important to distinguish between reality, science, and science fiction, What you see on your left is um, a guy that is blind. It's, it's possible since more than 20 years to directly feed in information into the visual one, like the visual uh, center of the brain. It's not that this blind guy was able to see again, but at least he was able to determine shapes. He actually was able to observe like, movements from left to right. So this is possible since quite a few years. However, on the right side, you see Matrix. Although I would love to have directly my iPhone pinched to my neural substrate, This is still science fiction. So we have to be very careful when we uh, read about that and when we see these kind of things. So what happened since 2001, 2005? I think many of you know that slide here. It's the Pope election in Rome. And when you compare it to 2013, although it's a little bit late, I do it again here. So five to ten differences here. It's digital revolution, of course, kicking in. So many people holding their mobiles into the air. Something has happened. Society is actually changing these days. And it was in the year 2015, 2016, where Sergey Brin mentioned that actually his iPhone is his third half of the brain. It is definitely also true for my iPhone. If it is too far away, I get a little bit nervous. It's actually here. So the question is, will there be only cyborgs in the future? Will it be the last generation who have witnessed like naked human beings without being leveraged by technology? And therefore, I like to convey today three core messages to you. I like to share with you three topics because I learned in neuroscience that the brain can optimally um, store three things. So therefore, let me quickly introduce these topics to you. Beware of the robot hype. There is no Hollywood Terminator yet. Second point, beware of the, beware of the AI hype. In particular, in case you're interested in creating AI. So be very careful and I like to discuss what I mean with that. And of course, my favorite topic, number three, we should become cyborgs. Let's tackle the mind code and create true AI. These are the three messages I'd like to discuss with you tonight. It was um, about three weeks ago where I was in the Chatel, and I've seen these Swiss robots, actually Swiss, built by Jacques Guedreau. And these robots are about 250 years old. And what these robots are capable of, they can actually play the piano, they can write letters, they can even draw. I mean, there are mysteries of microtechnology because the watch industry has actually a source from Neuchâtel, from the French part of Switzerland. So 250 years ago, we already were able to build robots, which we were able to program that actually looked like a human. So the question is, how does robotics look like these days? And yeah, so I think Robotics 2017 has a problem. And um, yeah, I, of course, got a little bit inspired from my professor um, because he actually visited many, many of these robot conferences. And a few pictures that I will share with you tonight are directly from uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, who is also here in the audience, but he told me I should not point to him. So, <laughs> okay. Let me share a video with you so that you have a little bit of impression about the state of robotics and about the expectations that are set towards so many robotics. Please turn on the sound.
Star for Robots. But didn't help a lot, yeah. So in a nutshell, I think the expectations that are set to robotics uh, are very high, of course. And the question is, what could we do? And when you look at the expectations, we expect like perfect functionality, personalities, human-like robots with a polished look. And uh, their reality looks a little bit different. They are like, actually, these robots here, they are like following a black line. Even a, one, like a first semester student is capable of programming that. It's actually lacking sensory feedback. So these robots are blind boxes moving around almost, and they look a little bit like a toy. And the question is a little bit, where does this hype about robotics come from? And when you check the news, it was uh, started by Google, like Google buying robotics companies and it was in the December 2013, then the economist actually has taken up that topic, and then I think we can trace that back about uh, in that year, this hype really started again. And uh, yeah, even today, like 2017, you see here the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, actually, there are also cute robots. There are also not so cute robots here. And it was uh, in August 2017 where they warned about killer robots. And maybe you're aware of this discussion between Elon Musk and Zuckerberg and Stephen Hawking. There are the so-called AI alarmists and there are the so-called AI optimists. And they're heavy battling. And the question is now, so what's true? What's actually uh, the case? I like to introduce to you the champion of humanoid robotics, which is actually um, Osimo. And uh, just have a look at how Osimo, the famous Honda robot, walks. And uh, I also know from a few insiders that it's actually not so easy to get a Honda a demonstration of Osimo because it needs about two or three days to prepare the stage to make sure that the surface is exactly as it is pre-programmed. And it looks a little bit like an astronaut by walking around. So this is the state of the art of robotics, and uh, it's actually invested millions of dollars to have that. And I find it a little bit frustrating and also disappointing when you consider that and when you compare that to our Neuchâtel robots like 250 years ago. I mean, whether you have like a clock, a watch, like a pumps and wheels in the back, or whether you have a Honda engine in your stomach, to me, from a principle level, doesn't change so much. Therefore, I find robotics extremely hard, and of course I was also taught that it's extremely hard. I'd just like to introduce to you like the robots from the AI lab in Zurich. Um, one of the very first robots that the group uh, around Roll 5 built was the Rufus Firefly there, 1995. It looks a little bit like a coffee machine on wheels. It was actually state of the art because the robot was uh, um, able to avoid obstacles. 2010, we took uh, human, like human-like skeletons, actually built them with, uh, with a certain material. And 2013, we built this Roboy um, um, robot, actually one of the cutest humanoid robots in the world. He has so many Facebook friends, and actually he has like red cheeks, and he can even have like there are like tears when you touch certain buttons. So people really think that Roboy is an emotional robot because it looks so cute. However, we built Roboy. We know exactly what is in there. Believe me, that's just a machine, and it's just like pre-programmed everything. But the question is, how will like uh, robotics look like? And I mean, if you look at the advancements here, of course there are advancements compared to the Neuchatel robots. There are sensors. There are already first feedback loops. But still, when you compare it to let's say one single human finger with like hundreds of sensors. I mean, we are nowhere close to those like sensor feedback loops that we would actually need. So let me show to you a few pictures. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to the service robotics industry, which is really impressive. I think assistive robotics, prosthetic devices, are really a great thing for human beings, even today. A lot of human beings benefit from that technology. And um, the problem is a little bit, when you compare that, we should not exaggerate with expectations. I mean, I also have a vacuum cleaner back home, and I think it's here, this guy here. 
He already crashed so many times with my wires. He actually fall down the stairs, and it's like the most modern human, like vacuum cleaner that I was able to afford. So I think that's a little bit uh, disappointing when you look at these service robotics uh, uh, robots these days. Also, um, and here these um, pictures have been collected also by Rolf. The social robots, to me, they do not look so social actually. And you guys can compare that also to like take the World Robotic Congress uh, in Beijing, like October 2016, like one year ago. When you compare them, when you take pictures of them, it is striking how these robots have a similar look. And this is like um, another series of pictures. I do fast forward, I show you like the pictures in 2017. So the robot show Shanghai in July 2017, actually a lot of pictures um, that Rolf took uh, there. And the thing is, there are investors, there are VCs that heavily invest in these companies. But my prediction is that not so many robots will survive because they look so um, equally. And also, what is the added value? And when you're really, really honest about the capabilities of these robots, I must uh, um, say that to me, these robots are not much more than actually iPhones on wheels. And this robot was also there. And I think that's a very honest uh, uh, one. And I think that's it. So the state of human and robotics do not go far beyond an iPhone on wheels. And I also find that a little bit disappointing. And therefore, the question is a little bit, what can we do? What can we do to prevent the bubble to burst? And I think there are three main bullet points that we should consider. One of those is for certain that scientists, I mean, you guys at ETH Zurich, um, politicians, but also the media, have a responsibility not to exaggerate and set expectations right and not to contribute to that huge, huge hype. The second point is also, please be realistic, please be honest. I mean, when you look at YouTube and you see those amazing robots, you have no clue how many hundred or even thousand times sometimes robots have to do a certain movement until they capture that and put it on YouTube. But the other, the other like 99% uh, of failed movements you never see. So therefore it's this kind of positive feedback loop that people are saying, oh, Terminator is knocking soon at our doors, but actually it may look a little bit different. And I also think if you really want this bubble not to burst, we should ultimately fulfill the expectations that investors set in these companies, that we set in these uh, companies. So there is actually only one bigger hype than robotics, and uh, this is actually the AI hype. And this brings me to the second uh, bullet point here. Uh, also one of my favorite topics because I'm heavily interested in AI, and I have to be really careful because I watched today the uh, exhibition uh, downstairs of REACH. I find it amazing. The state of the art is amazing. You find some of the finest robots in the world downstairs. And also I found about six or seven different definitions of AI. Unfortunately, every definition is a little bit different. So it seems that there is no consensus at what AI is. And therefore, let me describe the so-called AI hype. It's actually like a perfect storm. The robotics um, hype and the AI hype join forces. And when you look at these like names and now about these topics, like Society 5.0 in Japan is a topic, the Industry 4.0, you read everywhere. You read about Pepper and Baxter, almost in every exhibition I see Pepper. And you hear about Thomas Echo. You see about, even today, like about Hondosimo. And the thing is a little bit, what does that mean? And is it really the case that we are really progressing fast? And I call that the AI, and I'm aware that this is not a good definition of what AI is, but let me just like explain to you um, how we could also look at this AI perfect storm. And I also have to be very careful when I like to de-hype AI, because the CEO of Google himself said that we will move to an AI first world. So let me explain to you why I believe that it is quite a hype about AI. And the reason for that is, about um, 200 years ago, there was a huge debate about whether or not they created AI, or whether there was just a little bit like faking a human inside. And I explained to you what, what I mean by that. Uh, this was this famous so-called um, chess Turk. It was a machine that looked a little bit like a Turkish person, and that machine was able to move around pieces on a chessboard. And so the saying goes, for many decades, 
this machine was not beaten by human being. So actually this AI, this artificial intelligent machine, bet even Napoleon himself, and this is actually a famous uh, painting that you find somewhere. So believe me, about 200 years ago, there was also a huge hype because people said, we just created AI. However, when you look a little bit careful, there was a human inside. So it took them 84 years until they figured out that there actually were like small, very famous chess players, by the way, that bet those other chess players. And I mean, how long is current, the current AI hype? Is it 15 years? Is it 20 years? Of course, it comes in wave. But if they took like 84 years, how many years will we take until we find out that some certain products that certain companies sell, like branded with AI inside, is a little bit fake? And I fear a little bit that there will be also like a big, big bubble that may burst if we find out about the limitations about these uh, uh, projects. And therefore, it's a provocative statement. And uh, I like to summarize it that the AI today is kind of tint human intelligence put into source code. So a smart programmer has invested a lot of thought and actually, said, and actually programmed that, and then we call it AI. He kind of anticipated every situation, and of course, with deep learning and backpropagation, you can also optimize certain functions. But to me, it is comparable to the Tin Man here of the famous musical The Wizard of Oz. To me, it's cheating if you just put human intelligence into source code. I want to have a machine. I want to have like a device that is intelligent, creative, that cannot come up with, with new uh, inventions and not just like condensed uh, human intelligence in the box. Therefore, I'd like to introduce you quickly the systematics of AI. This is just one of many uh, uh, charts about that. The term AI is around since about 1950, where there was a famous conference about the topic. In 1980, where there were the, the, the rise of like fast computers, machine learning became possible. So you could do a lot of statistics with machine learning. And 2010, we, call, we, we say that the so-called deep learning algorithms became possible. Now, I have seen downstairs that there are a lot of deep learning algorithms. I, I know that there's a lot of uh, talk about backpropagation, etc. And therefore, I think there is a lot of value in these algorithms. The, um, the famous competition between like DeepMind, AlphaGo, and um, the world record holder in Go was predicted, I think, in the year 2014 to take at least another 20 years until a machine will be able to beat a human being in the play of Go. However, two days later, two years later, this became possible. So for once, a forecast was a little bit too uh, pessimistic. And I think that's a, a great achievement. And I also like to show to you another great achievement. And when you read about that, it reads a little bit like a 20, 20 minute uh, quote of today. It reads a little bit like one of those hypes uh, that you can read in all those newspapers. It's written about the very first artificial neural network that was presented in 1958, and it was written like the computer can walk, it can actually talk, reproduce itself, and soon be conscious of its existence. And um, I'd like to share with you what they actually showed to the New York Times so that they actually afterwards produced this article. This was the first Rosenblatt Perceptron, the very first artificial neural network. And all these networks here are kind of the foundation of what you read today about those very powerful deep learning and other um, um, algorithms. So just a crash course. I know it's late in the evening. This is the most complicated chart that I will share with you today. If you are through that, then I think um, uh, Opera will be soon and there. So you have a so-called input layer where you can put in, so let's say, numbers. You have a so-called weight layer, like weights, let's, let's say, 0 0.3. And here there is a so-called uh, net input function, just summing up all those inputs from these uh, input layers. And uh, if here arrives a value of, let's say, 5, there is an activation function saying, whenever the value is above 10, for example, I send a 1. And whenever the value is below 10, I send a 0. And based on that chart, the New York Times actually predicted a bright future for AI. So let me show to you today's artificial neural networks. Um, you put in like parameters like age or income or employment status. And here it turns it out that it's, it's a married guy, a single guy, or a completely broke uh, person. And these are actually the today's artificial neural networks grounding on these like first Rosenblatt perceptive architectures. And let me compare um, the 
very first perceptron, actually the weight was about 110 tons, like quite a huge computer, right? And uh, add, please, six years of intense research, trillions of dollars of cash invested, and 10 to the power of 12 computing power, and let's compare uh, how the architecture changed. Actually, it changed a little bit because we have more hidden layers, but from a qualitative level, not so much has changed. I will uh, substantiate that also afterwards, but it's a little bit frustrating for a person like me because I expect AI to rise soon. But when I see the advancements here, it seems to me that from a qualitative level, we haven't progressed a lot. So I also like to give you a famous example of the so-called uh, uh, the Panda example, how you could actually trick such an expensive deep neural network. So you add a, a picture of a panda and you add some colorful pixels and actually it still looks to the human eye like a panda. But for certain deep neural networks, that picture looks like a gibbon. So uh, the famous quote about that is, it is statistically impressive, but individually a little bit unreliable. So if you're seeing like a cat, but actually it should be a lion, that could be very lethal for a human being. So individually unreliable is not what we actually are looking for. And also, if you need 300 million pictures of cats in order to be able to say it's a cat or a horse or a cow, to me that is not so intelligent. I think big data is not nothing that we should uh, uh, too much bother with because I think intelligence would be small data. You look at one cat, you extract the principles, and once and for all you know what a cat is. And therefore I think whenever you read in a newspaper big data, deep learning and AI, Please be a little bit critical about this article. It may be a little bit the hype around that. Okay, next comparison. Um, when I talked uh, with my professor, I actually learned about this uh, chart here. And to me, it became instantly clear what the difference between those high-performing neural networks are and the human being. So take this chart. On the, the y-axis, you have the performance. On the x-axis, you have the competence and take a, a system like the DeepMind or Deep Blue computer, which actually bet uh, uh, the, the chess player, and um, it's an extremely performing um, um, device and even outperforming human beings. The thing is here, the competence of this device, of this machine, is not so, uh, so big, so I explained it to you. If you extended the, the chess board to a 10 to 10 chess board, those algorithms would not be able to generalize. Or another thing is also, if you ask a machine, what can you do with a pair of shoes? Machines will tell you, well, you can actually wear them. But a human being can tell you, well, you can plant a nail, you can do little boats with shoes, etc. So the transfer know-how is not yet there. So the machines are extremely performant. I mean, they are built for a certain task, and they, of course, outsmart or outdo human beings. But the problem is the competence, the generalization, this is not yet um, and there, and I think we should invest in technologies that are both competent and performing. And uh, yeah, of course, I invested also some thoughts, what kind of people or person or device could I place here? And uh, I think some politicians <laughs> are extremely competent, but not so performing, and because I'm a data here, I should actually hurry and, and hide this light. So. <laughs> Now, uh, going back to my tin uh, man here, I, uh, I talked a lot about artificial neural networks. I'd like to introduce to you the biological brain just to contrast those architectures. And here, a quick question to the plenum, just to uh, also, it, it's also interesting. Who thinks the eyes are to the left? Please vote your, uh, up your hand. Okay, who thinks the eyes are to the right? Okay. Um, Rolf, can I ask you why are the right the eyes to the right? Fifty uh, percent chance. Okay, yeah. Okay, then you, you took the wrong choice. So the eyes would be here. That's actually the cerebellum. And whenever you talk about the human brain, you should also factor in the spinal cord here. And together they have about 100 billion brain cells. And I'd like to show to you how such a brain cell looks like. And also to the engineers here at ETH, it's not like a straight line between two, two imaginary dots or so. It's actually a cell with about 10,000 branches connecting to many, many other brain cells, on average about five to 7,000. So this is how a brain cell looks like. 
And I also like to introduce you one of the very first videos about the living brain cell. And this is actually this one here. It wasn't so easy to record that. And um, what you see here is these brain cells um, remind me a little bit of organisms. So whatever is, is a white spot here is actually a synapse, like the famous structure connecting those brain cells with, with other brain cells. And I find it striking how these structures are very mobile. Also this one here, this is a brain cell which was planted on a Petri dish. It's actually growing here. And what you see here, it's a little bit like a hand-like structure at the very end of the tip of a, of a, of a neurite, looking for other brain cells to, uh, to contact. And if you've seen these pictures, I think you start with another approach. You start to believe in a different way, not thinking that the brain is just like a fast computer. I think the brain might more be like a superorganism constituted by 100 billion of actors. And therefore, I think, and there, there I find an inspiring um, comparison. A few hundred years ago, people wanted to build artificial birds. So what did the scientists do? Of course, they dissected the biological bird. They witnessed and they figured out there are feathers and bloods and bones. And maybe you know from the history books, these wooden devices never really took off, right? So today, I think, neuroscientists uh, commit the same error. They want to replicate the brain. They discover 100 billions of brain cells, and then they launch these huge projects where you try to copy-paste nature. And I'm actually aware of a PhD thesis where someone simulated a droplet of water with some of the fastest supercomputers you can even imagine. And after about four or five years of heavy computational simulation and research, that guy was able to, to hit like play, and I think about 18 seconds or so, he was able to simulate the droplet of water. I mean, water is not such a complicated uh, chemical, right? So I think it was uh, Leonardo da Vinci back in the days who said, if you really want to build an artificial bird, it's just the wing profile, the shape of the wing, which is important. It's not so much about the feathers and about the blood in case you want to have something that flies. And I think, therefore, we should focus on the principles of the brain and not try to copy nature. We are lacking the technology for that, and I think the principle uh, could be very close if you are looking for that. Second, uh, the third message that I like to share with you tonight. This is a, a, a very um, visual this description of the digital transformation. Yesterday, actually, I gave a presentation with an insurance company. So the insurance company was looking for the icon here. And the question was, are they already behind the wave or did they already go under? Where is the insurance industry? So you see many industries are these days disrupted. And I think it's extremely important to embrace latest um, technology in order to, to stay in the game. And what I see often is there are Swiss CEOs, there are managers, there might even be researchers or scientists that tell me, yeah, I just can't. I know I should change something. Maybe I should look into a different spot. But you know, maybe later, maybe in two or three years from now. And if I had such a t-shirt, I would love to give that to some people that I know. And uh, I think um, we, we should not uh, play here in that, uh, with that attitude. Another question is also, do we play in the team robot? Or do we play like in the team human? And of course, I'm biased. We need to play in the team human. And it's very, very important to tool up, to embrace latest technology in order to stay relevant, because we have one, one problem as a human being. And when you look at the development of the human brain, it is a little bit linear. I do not discuss the slope tonight, how, the, how this, uh, where it's pointing to. But definitely, these machines, these advancements in AI in brackets, are exponential at some point in time. Also be very careful about predictions. I know that there is a phenomenon called singularity, where people predict that everything will be exponential, and soon, like very fast computers, will outsmart machines. Those exponential trends are often actually not exponential, but actually follow a sigmoid trend. And for example, Moore's law is one that is broken these days, so it's not exponential anymore. So be very careful when you see these charts here. Actually, the chart should then look like, like this uh, um, later. I would love to have such a lens on my eye. Whenever I, uh, you ask me like a very tough question, I'm here at ETH Zurich, so I could face many tough questions. Um, I would love to have such a teleprompter on my eye. And whenever you ask me something, the teleprompter, the smart lens would exactly tell me what I need to, to say, what I need to tell you. And you would have the impression that Pascal Kaufmann is very, very smart, but I'm actually just reading um, all the answers. And these kind of systems 
as things become available, and I like to show to you how this may look like. So this is um, me sitting here in the office of Küsnacht in, in our company, and uh, this is me actually sitting back home, uh, uh, sitting on a bed here. This is my TV screen here, a little bit boring, I must admit, it's very static, and this TV screen is surrounded by a lot of browser windows. And I think if you have such a technology, you can do a lot of things. So question to the plenum quickly, who has um, already worn such a augmented reality lens? I'm not talking about virtual reality, because whenever I, 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 I wear these virtual reality glasses, I kind of get sick, because it goes up and down, and I sit on a chair, and so my brain cannot cope with that. Also, the problem is a little bit, when you have virtual reality, it could also be like a very, very big like TV screen. So I'm talking about augmented reality, looking at reality, where like information about certain people are just like fed in, so that I know everything that is possible, that is um, possible to know about the person. So who has already tried out such a HoloLens? Please raise your hands. It's always very interesting. So the other 60, 70 percent, I strongly suggest that you try that out because I'm wearing these kind of devices since many years, and I was always disappointed. I mean, in the year 2002, I had a device on my head with about 16 pixels in front of me. It was so uh, boring and frustrating. And when I had the Google Glass in my eye, this eye here had to focus, and the other eye looked uh, forward, so I also got sick instantly. And when I uh, tried out the HoloLens, I was blown away. Of course, that is, um, that is very clumsy. It's a prototype. But you can imagine that one day these devices will turn so small that you can access know-how instantly, and the question arises, what do we actually need to learn at school? What do we teach to our children if it becomes completely irrelevant which Roman killed which other Roman? Because that you can read from Wikipedia, right? So I think it's important to embrace these technologies. And then the question comes, well, will I be over overwhelmed? Will I be flooded by information? How could we harness these kind of technologies? And there are technologies in the world that can leverage these information highways. And when you consider it, there are, for example, a lot of know-how is exchanged on a daily basis. Do we really capture that in a systematic way? I, th I don't think that we do that these days, but it's actually possible to capture the information highways. And if we could somehow systematically leverage them, I think we could really do an advancement in, in science. Also, what is important, there is a so-called human know-how challenge. Just about 20% of what the human knows, it's really documented somewhere. You also see that in, in corporations where they talk about knowledge management, about 80% of know-how of a person is the gut feeling. It's an intuition, it's kind of, I know it, but I don't write it down, etc. So how frustrating if you have knowledge management systems that are just able to capture 20% of what a person knows. If we were able to capture everything, that would be awesome. And I think, therefore, human work 2.0 will definitely talk to these artificial corporate brains or educational brains. And uh, there are technologies doing that. I give an example of Swisscom for, um, here in Switzerland. So Swisscom employees can take the mobile devices. They can fire a question to their Swisscom corporate brain. And while they are typing, the brain interrupts uh, the person who asks the question saying, stop, you don't need to complete asking that question because someone else already had a few years ago. This is directly the solution. And if you belong to the 8, 9, 10% of people able to formulate a really new question, then algorithms figure out which person within Swisscom would now be um, perfectly suited to instantly solve that question at hand. And these algorithms here are actually grounding on some artificial new network um, architectures. It's statistics, so to speak, but they are very powerful in combination with human beings. So I think as, soon, as long as we don't have true AI, our best weapon is definitely connecting human brains and build those superorganisms able to outsmart any artificial device and any supercomputer. And if we systematically do that, I think we can definitely advance and progress science and accelerate um, how we do research. And these technologies actually exist, and the question is a little bit, how will we be able to harness that? Will we be able to do a breakthrough in AI? And when you are looking at the Silicon Valley, Everyone is crazy about AI. They, they actually tell us we just need more computational power. And I was really happy and, and pleased to read um, the statement of Geoffrey Hinton. He actually is a Google researcher. It's a very famous guy in backpropagation. He developed some of the, of the best uh, described algorithms. And he said that the future of AI depends on some graduate student 
who is deeply suspicious of everything I said or I've taught him. We need to start all over. So this is a direct address to all the students here. If your professor are teaching you that the brain is a fast computer, please challenge your professor. And please do not fall into that trap to assume that the brain is a computer because a few hundred years ago, people thought there are pumps and wheels in the brain. Today, the most complicated devices that we have are computers, and therefore we equate the brain with computers. Please do not do this mistake. I think that's not a, a very um, a promising way. And yeah, closing then the presentation about AI, I'd like to introduce to you not God, Apollo is uh, one of the most uh, famous gods in the ancient Greek mythology. However, Prometheus is a much older god than Apollo, and it was Prometheus himself who stole the fire from the gods, from Zeus, and inspired humans and created, actually, uh, the human race. And what you see here is the Prometheus with the fire, and here is like a human being without intelligence, without a soul. And the question is, will we be able to build artificial organisms? Will we be able to create AI? I think we will be able, and it is just a matter of time until we, we have that. And looking back to the Apollo mission, to the race for space, whenever I'm flying back from the US and I land here in Zurich, I have to cool down a little bit because I have the impression that there is no race in AI going on here in Switzerland. So many countries are heavily investing into AI, but here I think we don't do a lot because you remember the T-shirt, for example, maybe in two or three years from now. I suggest that we in Switzerland also take part in this race for artificial intelligence. We have some of the best conditions, some of the best parameters that you can imagine. We could attract talents from around the globe. We have some of the best universities here. We have ETH Zurich, the leading uh, continental Europe um, um, research institution. I mean, if we do not take on a leading role here, who will? It will be um, like big corporations. It might be countries that are lacking certain ethical um, standards. So we definitely don't want that intellectual property for AI is owned uh, by, by these um, institutions or people. And therefore, I'd like to introduce to you something which is yet uh, still inofficial. And I talked quickly today with Ata Zurich about that. It's the Mindfire program. Of course, it's inspired by the moon landing program. And I'd like to quickly introduce to you what this is all about. And because of these technologies that are able to identify talents around the globe, that are able to, to see what people are browsing, what people are doing, we can actually come up with profiles of scientists and we can actually single out talents. Assume we identified the 100 most intelligent, most promising, most creative, most curious people, and we invite them all to Switzerland, 100 people, and lock them in into a Swiss chalet. And for 14 days, they are not allowed to leave the chalet. Of course, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, very, uh, it's a little bit exaggerated there, but they actually have one single task to break um, the, the, the mind code to create true AI. How do we do that? How do we want to achieve that? We invite the leading 15, 20 brain researchers, AI specialists in the world. We invite them all to Davos. And for about two days, they brainwash those 100 talents. These are young people, 16-year-old guys that just won the, Olympic, um, the Olymp Olympia in like, uh, informatics or biology. And they are um, taught the state of the art in, in AI and brain research. After two days, those top scientists leave the stage and the talents have 12 more days to tackle the brain code. And how do they measure success? I mean, how do we say they just created AI? We believe in prototypes. We believe in tangible results. We believe in artificial organisms, so to speak. And Mindfire 1 is built like a hackathon. If there is no result or not like AI after those 14 days, and the chances are pretty high that they won't do that with the very first mission, there will be Mindfire 2, Mindfire 3, Mindfire 4 until there is a breakthrough. And uh, yeah, let me share the video with you. Of course, I'm a fan of JFK, and therefore the video here, uh, it's about the We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mindfire is launching a powerful attempt at elucidating the functional principle of the brain. That challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. It won't take development of new technologies and materials. It doesn't need investment of billions of dollars. It doesn't need to be fueled by an ongoing arms race. All it takes to crack the brain code is humanity.
unite the talents of the world. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won. And they must be won and used for the progress of all people. Down in the booth, actually, the brain hotel. Very big. Point projectors to that brain hotel and turn this hotel into the largest brain in the world for 14 days. And with that initiative, we try to bring the epicenter of AI to Switzerland. I think it's a great place here to attract talents around the globe. And yeah, the spirit is a little bit like the moon landing program. I think the time has come to do that because of the technology that we have, the talents that we have, and also the position that we have. Switzerland is leading the ranking list in innovation. Switzerland is leading the robotics um, impact factors. We have some of the most cited research papers around the globe. So why shouldn't we build upon this momentum and try to take on a leading role in AI? And to give you a first glance how this may look like, I don't want to scare you before opera, of course, but that is actually the hands-on um, um, the spirit of Mission One. There will also be a logo, and I think uh, please stay tuned. I just today got confirmation of ETH Zurich that we are able to host a press conference about Mindfire here, which will take place in the mid of November. And then I think this initiative will become public. And I um, already know that a lot of companies, uh, Davos as a city, and also uh, other institutions are supporting Mindfire. And it would be great if you stay tuned and that you as smart ETH uh, researchers kind of help here doing a breakthrough. So let me summarize. Human Worker 2.0, talking to artificial brains, thinking with the power of 1,000 brains. Human Worker 3.0, or you could also say Human Researcher 3.0, is embracing technology. So technology comes closer and closer. I would love to have that directly into my uh, neural system. And the Human Worker 4.0 is actually just a robot. I mean, why do we bother with creating jobs? I could well imagine a world without jobs. Why don't we give that all to the robots and we focus on much more interesting stuff? I mean, there are many planets we haven't yet discovered. There are a lot of countries I haven't been. I could well imagine a world without jobs. And I find that always a little bit uh, striking when we talk about these topics. And a few hundred, uh, uh, 100 years ago, people said, oh, we have to work for 18 hours a day. If I told them that one day they may have to work for eight hours a day, they would have been shocked. They would say, but what do I do with the other 10 hours that I just have like spare time? Today, I find it a little bit sad that people have, that people have such a, uh, that they cannot imagine a world where they don't need to work. That kind of human beings define themselves by work. I think there might be other options and it would be great if we could give those jobs to robots and progress science. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Pascal, for that fascinating vision of both what's to come and important messages we should bear in mind for the coming decades. We have some time for a few questions. Um, there are microphones in everyone's chest. They're activated, so just pick one up and press the button. Uh, please be nice. I don't have my lens in my eye, so I have to come up with answers myself. So. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kaufmann, thank you very much. Great presentation and very down-to-earth perspective on, on this space. Um, not to be the noise advocate, absolutely, honestly, but I'm a bit confused with the closing about um, Mindfire because I, I don't understand if it comes in conflict with what you described in your opinion AI in really big, right? Um, you, you started out describing AI as something that would not come from explicitly trying to program machines to do what people do, that makes sense. And also there was a, a quote in the Tinman slide that said that maybe even statistical observation of humans is not the way to AI. And then Mindfire is basically about, like you said, brainwashing a hundred very young, like pure creative minds about how the brain actually works and then trying to get them to dissect that and make AI out of it. So do you find that Mindfire that is a good step forward or is it kind of in a wrong direction? Well, I definitely think we should look out for the new Newton. So um, Newton, so the saying goes, 
uh, an apple was falling, an apple was falling to his head, and then he discovered the tree like uh, uh, lost to direct the planets and the stars around. So before the new, before Newton, people said we will never find out how those stars and planets are circling around. It's so complicated. They filled huge books with like trajectories of planets. Assume a student, a talent, faces a question and says, "Whoa, why don't we do it like that?" Liverpool, a so-called Newtonian moment. I'm looking for that Newton. And in every mind fire mission, we will have other talents building upon the outcomes of the other missions before that. I think that's a fruitful approach. And if not, we can at least say we tried it. Because if you just do nothing and you wait that AI happens or knocks at your door, I don't think that's a good strategy. Therefore, we should take on a leading role in AI. You said social innovation or product innovation. What would I prefer? So challenging questions at ETH uh, in, a, in a late, late uh, um, day. I'm not so sure whether I really understood the question, but uh, give, let me give me a shot. So Mindfire is really about a momentum, about triggering a mindset that uh, we can crack the brain code, actually the mind code, because the, the brain is the intelligence interest in the brain and it's in the interaction between uh, the environment, uh, the body, etc. So it's about a momentum. I think that sets social impacts, so it's an enthusiasm and optimism, but it also will ultimately lead to new products. Because even if we don't crack intelligence at the very first missions, there might be very interesting outcomes that would be beneficial. Also with the moon landing, uh, from these um, uh, heavy investments in, in space exploration, a lot of products and technologies have been derived. I expect the same for like uh, AI missions. Therefore, I think it's social, you unite the talents, but it could also have uh, like a product uh, impact. But I'm not so sure whether I got the question right, and maybe I should get now the lens done. Okay, please, yeah. Yonis. Um, thanks. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Yes. Um, thanks for this very inspiring talk. So I was wondering though if uh, the tin human, uh, tin human or tin robot tin, um, is still an accurate description of what AI research is about today because those neural networks, I'm sure you know, um, learn from examples and then do generalize to examples that they haven't seen and they can be creative in the sense um, that let's say Google Deep Dream produces images and pictures that no human has basically distilled into, into them. So they um, think with the power of a thousand brains in the sense that more than a thousand humans have supplied the statistics and the knowledge that it now aggregates into concepts. So isn't that creativity and isn't that more than just having a small human basically pulling the strings? So I know Yonis actually, he works at the Institute of Neuroinformatics and it's a huge stretch. I mean, they're like superstars like you working on stochastic synaptical firing and they will ask me some very tough questions. On the other hand, I have in the audience people that tell me, Pascal, I have no clue what AI is or these robots or not. So in this presentation, I need to find the right abstraction level. And I fully agree with you. This is an extreme simplification. And I do not believe that we are just have like tint human, uh, tint boxes and, and coin it with AI. But at least the, the, the statement is made that often what we call AI is actually human intelligence put in the source code. And you're right, there are actually exceptions to that, but it's very hard to find the right abstraction with a person like you, which works at the top cutting edge of neuroscience. Of course, these simplifications may not be sufficient. Why don't we know more about the human brain? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. So one problem when you talk about the human brain is that those brain cells are so tiny. And I give an example. My very first um, lecture here was with Professor Nicholas Omrein. He's a, a famous biologist, actually. And I asked Professor Omrein, do we know how trees uh, branch, actually? And trees are a huge device. In nature, you can uh, uh, investigate them since many hundreds of years. And he told me that it's still mystery. You don't even know how trees get their branches. I was shocked when I heard that. I mean, imagine those brain cells here, so tiny that you don't even see them. How should we figure out how they really grow and don't work? So one problem is definitely the size of the brain. And another, uh, another problem is also, 
It's not that these brain cells are so, so complicated, but it's the vast number of 100 billion of those devices that somehow interact together, which is very puzzling to us. We are not even able to properly describe how three spheres circle around. Imagine now 100 million, billion of brain cells embedded in some chemistry, shaking around. How should we even simulate or even grasp that on a theoretical level? So I think it's the size of those brain cells. It's also the complexity of the matter. And it's just something that is, is not yet discovered. So we have, other, we have made other discoveries, but the brain is so complicated, we can't even access that right. We don't have the right technique to access brain cells these days. We can talk with about hundreds or maybe thousands brain cells at the same time. How about the other billion of brain cells? There's such a narrow window into the neural substrate. This is a problem. Please. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for your speech. It was super interesting. Um, I want to ask, my question kind of relates to the question before. Um, in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of ventures like Neuralink, Elon Musk, or Brian Johnson's kernel. And what, you, what is your perspective as a neuroscientist? How far away are such advanced BMIs? And yeah, how realistic are these ventures? I'm glad that you asked the question because the uh, TechCrunch Journal um, called uh, us in Switzerland and asked exactly that question. They asked us, what is your opinion about the recent publication of uh, Neuralink? But also they asked, they have just discovered a language, like computers talking to each other and we don't understand the language. Is it an AI language? I think Swiss people are very bad at selling. So if a Swiss person had invented such a device, and the Swiss person doesn't understand anymore what these guys are doing, they would say, okay, we just failed, we have to do, uh, do another thing. But there, they call it, it's AI, just we don't understand it. And I find that really, I find that really striking at some point, like sometimes, how these people are great sales, sales guys. And uh, what I think of Neuralink, um, it's definitely a, a good story. I mean, a lot of media are reporting about that. But when you talk to the neuroscience people, they even reject to give interviews on that topic. I mean, I've worked with, with electrodes and brains. Uh, it was a huge endeavor to pinch one electrode into one brain cell. Of course, today we have other... Uh, uh, now imagine like a direct link to the brain. If you don't understand the language of the brain, how should you talk to the brain? I'm very, very skeptical about Neuralink, but I like Elon Musk a lot. I mean, he's a great uh, sales guy and a great uh, entrepreneur, but I think there he uh, overdid it a little bit. Yeah. Please. I wanted to know, uh, kind of in line with uh, your hopes for what artificial intelligence can do for us, what you think or what you hope, uh, kind of how we define ourselves in the future. So what could be the role of human in a world full of AI? Is this the question? Yeah. So that's actually a very tough question, and I'm not even sure whether AI is really a good thing. I think you can't stop human progress, you can't stop these developments, and therefore I think we need uh, uh, to, to take an active role there. But assume now an imaginary world where there is everything AI, I think that's an old dream of, of, of mankind to create something that is beyond a human being. So many scientists are doing that, are, are looking into that, and if you could do like a next step in, in evolution, create an artificial species, so to say, that may discover the planets that may go out to the universe, that is something very, very interesting and inspiring for a human being. But I have to admit, this is a question about the consequences of AI that goes beyond um, my imagination these days. What I can say for certain is, it may most likely not be as we imagine to be. It's not that there will all be autonomous cars around us. It might even be that there are just brains in dishes that are sitting back home in the cellar somewhere. There is actually no need for transportation anymore because you can directly feed information to your, uh, to your uh, neural tissue. So a lot of predictions ground on what we know today, and I think we should uh, take that into consideration that the future might completely look different than we imagined it to be. And if I did now a prediction, and in 10 years from now you see that on YouTube and you could say Pascal has actually uh, uh, said again uh, something completely wrong, that would also be embarrassing to me, of course.
<laughs> Please. Good evening, Dr. Kaufman. Um, yeah, also thank you for your speech. Uh, my name is Manuel Francesco, and uh, yes, I have used that uh, tool that you mentioned about. Uh, it's called Ask the Brain in Swisscom, and I'm really going to answer really quickly. But anyway, now to my question. Um, I really like your reason about employee 4.0. Uh, maybe you have some ideas. My question is, how should we prepare our children's generation for employee 4.0 today? That's actually a very, very good question. How should we teach our children? What, how should the education system look like? Will politics be actually able to keep up with the inventions in technology? Considering society with connected scientists, does science really wait until the politicians say, um, okay, now we have to put in and install this and that regulations? I really doubt it. I, I fear a little bit that our educational system is definitely lagging behind. I mean, I said it already, I had to learn like ancient Greek uh, words. I had to learn which Roman killed which other Roman. Co today, completely unnecessary because I can read it on Wikipedia. So I wish that today's young children learn different stuff compared to what I learned. However, when I look at, my, uh, at, at those little children, so when, I, when I see what they're doing, they're learning exactly the same that I did. So I'm a little bit skeptical and a little bit worried whether this is a good thing. I definitely think we should also change the education system in order to prepare humans for that. And uh, yeah, there are many ongoing debates about that. And maybe you remember that chart here that was politically a little bit incorrect, but I just want to show it again to you. Sometimes when I talk to politicians in Switzerland, I feel that they really are not embracing latest technology uh, here. So this is a little bit of a problem. Like if just people, the non-digital natives do politics, how should they know and understand what the digitalization is all about? So I think also young people should go into politics and help shape these uh, developments. Yeah. I have to do that way. I think... Um, we have time for like two last questions, otherwise you hate me because there is opera outdoors and you can't access that. So, please. Hello, thank you for your speech. You mentioned these bubbles, so the expectations are very high in both robotics and AI. And many companies invest billions of dollars. What do you think would be the economic impact if these bubbles first? I mean, we do not know if the expectations will be met. Now I would love to be an, economic, uh, an economics person. I would have needed to choose another university than ETH or Zurich because it's an economics question, right? So what if all those companies fail and all those VCs um, lost their cash? I think also in, that co in those companies that fail, there might be interesting developments, there might be interesting outcomes. But you're right, um, there will be many, many companies that horribly fail and uh, yeah, it's hard to say. I think when you see who are the VCs, often these are tech entrepreneurs that have like billions of dollars and they invest like 500 million there, 200 million there. If they lose all their cash, I think they won't like uh, instantly uh, starve. So it's a very hard question, but I think those VCs would be able to cope with the uh, loss of their cash. And this cash is investing to society in smart people doing research, etc. I also think these investments have some impacts but maybe not like AI. But I have to admit that's a tough question. You should ask a neuroscience question to me. Please. Thank you so much for your talk. So uh, my question is, how do you see the future of AI in I love neural plasticity. This means that um, brain cells are extremely adaptive. They um, react to changes and the, the growth uh, of those brain cells, also that they are sensitive to timely events, is something that is almost completely neglected in, in most artificial neural network uh, architectures. Yeah, I think plasticity should be considered. And I think also the so-called spike timing dependent plasticity is a very, very interesting learning rule that may have a lot of potential. I would love to see more work on spike timing dependent plasticity because I think you have the timely resolution and the plasticity and we should put them into artificial neural networks to see what the impact is. I love the topic and maybe during the opera we can discuss about that. Yeah? Okay, actually, the final question, which question is more difficult there? <laughs> okay, I go with you, yeah? First of all, I want to thank you for your presentation. I'm out of ETH for a couple of years and uh, I get to see a lot of presentations, but this one was really, really, really 
more today would be really interesting. My question relates to um, the brain. We have an example of the brain that has been developed over the, next, the last few decades, which is the internet. Is there anything we can learn from its development, from how it's grown, how it's been developed, what it is now that we could potentially apply to AI? There are actually very small people uh, that told me that maybe the internet is already an emergent um, organism. It's actually already kind of conscious and intelligent. Why don't we more investigate into the dynamics of the internet? And I like that, um, I like that theory a lot because the internet has all the ingredients that um, we suspect are like, uh, important to create something like intelligence. For example, the internet has sensors. I mean, embodied human beings interacting in the environment. When you look at the Internet of Things, even devices will get sensors. If you have such so much sensory power, and you can then somehow connect it with actuators, you have all the ingredients or a lot of ingredients that are very very important to create those sensory feedback loops that are very very important. I, I would love to understand better how the internet dynamics work. However, I'm also a little bit skeptical when you look at the biased information that we get in the internet. So when you are Googling something and I am Googling something, you get completely different results than I get. And uh, when you are voting for this politician and I vote for the other politician, so we don't really know how much we can trust the internet. Although I would love to, uh, to investigate the internet, I fear that's a little bit biased and that might not be a good uh, thing to then do an experiment with, right? But I, I like the... Uh, the, the idea a lot. Yeah. Okay, I think I need to pass back to Matthew, otherwise you'll never invite me here to wait the uh, alma mater auditory maximum. It, uh, thank you very much for your attention, so late in the evening, and uh, yeah, I expect you. All right, let's thank Pascal. <laughs>